We started World War II last time. It's a big topic. So let's finish it up today. What were the causes and consequences of the Allied victory in World War II? We had ended last time talking about uh, some of the impacts of the World War II on minority populations. I think we referred to them as marginalized groups. One of the big impacts was on Japanese Americans. Um, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, the United States historical bias towards the Asian populations on the West Coast kicks in. Remember all the way back to the post-Reconstruction era, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s, the Gentlemen's Agreement in 1907. Uh, th there's many more examples of these throughout history on the West Coast. And when Japan attacked at Pearl Harbor, there was this immediate reaction that the Japanese Americans or Americans of Japanese descent, not even just recent immigrants, but people going back generations, um, were potential threats to the United States on the West Coast. Um, the assumption was that they would side with Japan over America, even third, fourth, fifth generation uh, Japanese Americans. So in order to, uh, well, the, the argument was that in order to protect the West Coast, uh, the Japanese on the West Coast, Japanese Americans on the West Coast must be sent to these forced relocation camps, um, similar to concentration camps. Uh, and Franklin Roosevelt initiates this with Executive Order 9066. So try not to get that confused with the other executive order. But in Order 9066, Japanese Americans are sent to forced relocation camps, most of them away from the West Coast, many of them in inland deserts. And you can see in this picture here, that barbed wire is keeping people in. Those are the buildings that they lived in. Um, very, very inhumane conditions. And you can tell it's inhumane just by the fact that these people are wearing tags as if they're luggage. It's an obviously unjust racist policy. Um, they're were no real German internment camps. We'll talk about that more later. Um, but this was directly targeting Japanese Americans simply for the fact that they were Japanese descent. Some Japanese Americans did, um, did fight this. Uh, for example, uh, Korematsu versus the United States was a Supreme Court case in which Korematsu sued, saying that this forced internment was a violation of civil rights. And the Constitution upheld the internment camps, uh, said that the government had a vested interest in interning the Japanese uh, because they uh, could have been a potential threat during the wartime. Uh, this was a common mentality. Here's Dr. Seuss, right? They're, for all the stuff that Dr. Seuss said did was great, this is one of his flaws. Um, this is showing the Japanese as all Japanese Americans being potential threats on the West Coast. Uh, because they might side with the um, Japanese over the United States. So what does Korematsu tell us? Well, when you combine it with, say, Dred Scott versus Sanford, um, and a few others, Schenck versus the United States, uh, the story of the Supreme Court is complicated. Oftentimes, the Supreme Court upholds violations to civil liberties, and it doesn't always protect minority rights. So the, civil, the Supreme Court is made up of Americans and it's made up, and, and while it does try to remain unbiased, I mean, it's still held to uh, standards of their era. Okay, so let's talk about the actual fight in World War II. We're going to try to go through this relatively quickly. Um, let's start in Europe, because according to the Atlantic Charter, which we talked about last time, the United States paired with Britain and with France and then with the Soviet Union. And under the Atlantic Charter, they agreed that Hitler was the bigger threat. And even though there is a bombing at Pearl Harbor, the United States would focus on Europe first. They're going to hold off in the Pacific and focus on Europe. <clears throat> so the war strategy was to try to open up a second front. Now, on the West, I'm sorry, on the Western side, which is France, uh, that's where the United States is going to focus. But on the Eastern Front, which is all the way over here, well, let's see, over here, right? That's where the Germans were invading the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, already taking millions of casualties, is begging for that second front. They are desperate to open up a second front that would force the Germans to get away from the Soviet Union, go 
into France to defend against the American invasion. Um, the America's first effort with the British was to swoop down across Spain and into Northern Africa. And from Northern Africa, they would move into Italy, right? They'd go from Sicily and they'd move into Italy. It doesn't really work. Okay, so the Americans and the British capture most of northern France, uh, northern Africa, and then they get to Italy, and Mussolini falls fairly quickly, and then the Germans kind of plug the gap, and they move into northern Italy and stop uh, the invasion there. So Operation Torch, this idea of coming up through Africa and up through Italy, doesn't really open up the second front that the Nazis had been, I'm sorry, that the, uh, the Soviets had been hoping for. They then shift into this strategic bombing of Europe. Uh, they target rail lines, production plants, trying to soften Germany up for a potential invasion. Later, um, the United States and, and Great Britain is going to be criticized as not doing enough to prevent concentration camps. Um, a lot of the rail lines that they targeted did uh, end up going into camps. Uh, but this delayed invasion uh, not only hurt the, the Soviets because the Nazis still kept attacking on that front, but all of these death camps, like these concentration camps and death camps, they, they remained operational and it killed a lot more Jewish people than an immediate opening of that second front. So when does the second front occur? Well, it occurs with Operation Overlord, which we probably better know as the D-Day invasion of Normandy. And this occurs in June of 1944 or about a year and a half or so after the United States officially joins the war. Um, remember, that's in 1942. So we go through, uh, you know, basically January 42 uh, through all of 1942, I guess two and a half years. So 42, 43, and then halfway through 44. So two and a half years uh, it takes to open up that Eastern Front or Western Front. Meanwhile, the Eastern Front is being devastated. But when the United States has this amphibious assault, across the English Channel, the United States, Britain, and others land in northern France. They swoop through northern France, and within a month, they occupy and liberate all of France. The Soviets are going to push back on the eastern front, and from there, it's kind of this push in towards the capital, and the capital is right here at Berlin. So the Americans are coming from this side, and the Soviets are coming from this side, and they're going to meet in the middle. Uh, this, the Nazis don't um, accept this, obviously. They want to push back. Um, Nazi Germany attempts the Battle of the Bulge. They want to break that, that Western Front line, so they plunge all of their forces uh, into the line right here, it's called the Battle of the Bulge, not the Battle of the Break. So the line bulges, and then it snaps back. It's the last major German offensive of World War II. This failed attempt to break the American-British lines. If they could have break in the, broken the lines, they could have gotten all around. And maybe forced the, not the uh, Americans and the British out. <clears throat> but at this point... The Nazis are simply going to retreat back to Berlin and ultimately be defeated. Once that occurs, the Allies attempt to figure out what to do for the end of the war. Uh, they meet at Yalta, uh, which is just the location that they met. Um, here is uh, Churchill from Britain. And this is Franklin Roosevelt from the United States. And that's Joseph Stalin from the Soviet Union. Uh, what they agree to at Yalta is the creation of a United Nations. And this is a response to World War I. Remember, with the Treaty of Versailles, the League of Nations was included in the World, of, uh, World War I treaty, and the United States refused to join. So this is the United States trying to fix that error that they made by not helping participate in a world system that would prevent these future world affairs. Um problem for the Allied powers is that the United States and Britain, these guys are capitalist democracies. And they don't really trust this guy, Joseph Stalin, because Stalin is in a communist dictatorship. So there is a wedge 
between these two groups and the capitalists and the communists don't really trust each other. They're working together right now because they need to defeat the, the Nazis. But this is going to be a problem, right? Because after World War II, immediately Stalin and the United States and Britain are going to fight against each other in the Cold War. A couple of months after this picture, Roosevelt dies. Harry Truman is going to be the president at the end of the war, and it's Truman that's going to make the decision on the atomic bomb. All right. So um, Germany surrenders in May of 1945. Uh, Hitler committed suicide in um, April of 1945. Um, so it's actually Hitler's already dead by the time Germany surrenders. But you can see here the Soviets are coming from the east and the Americans and the British are coming from the west and they're pushing towards Berlin, which is the capital right there above that flag. And the interesting thing is that line right here on the uh, western side, <coughs> that line is going to stay there for the next 50 years or so. The United States is going to occupy western Germany and the Soviets are going to occupy eastern Germany. And, and they're going to keep that division, maintain that split. When the United States and the British start to uh, move through um, France and into West Germany and start liberating territories, um, they start to open up all of those death camps. Uh, they, they, they find them. Uh, sometimes they were able to liberate some people that survived. The Holocaust is the term that we use for the attempt at genocide um, that Hitler called the final solution, right? People were asking the Jewish question, what do we do with the Jewish people in Europe? Um, nobody seemed to want them. The United States didn't want them even. Uh, they had an immigration quota on the Jewish population. So Hitler's final solution was to just try to murder them all. It can be traced back all the way to those Nuremberg laws we looked at in 1935. Uh, the dehumanization, the stripping of the citizenship, the uh, all of that can be traced all the way back to 35, even earlier than that, the historical anti-Semitism. The Holocaust sees 6 million Jewish people murdered, another 6 million other people, including um, Roma gypsies, political prisoners, um, LGBTQ people, um, anybody that the Aryan Nazis saw as unfit, right, that they wanted to eliminate from their sort of genetic pool. <clears throat> what was the United States response to the Holocaust? Well, before the war, the United States wasn't willing to help Jewish refugees. Um, we can see that with the tragedy of the St. Louis in 1939. Before, even before Hitler attempted to have that final solution, Jewish people in Germany and in Europe were trying to leave, and America didn't really help. So uh, and part of the reason is the hypocrisy issue. Stalin had his death camps. He kills 14 million people himself, uh, political prisoners and people that he thought were enemies to the Communist Party. He's not really any better. He can't be held to a higher standard. The United States is going to have Japanese internment camps where the U.S. was throwing people into concentration camps. They assumed that the Nazis were doing a similar thing, like not death camps, but so there's a problem, right? So the United States is going to feel guilty about this. All of those nativist fears, the immigration quotas, all of that is going to make them want to do something following the war. One of the things that happens is that Nazi leaders are going to try to be held accountable for these actions. Once the true horrors of the Holocaust is unleashed, once people saw the bodies and the, the crematoriums and all these other things, they realized it was so much worse than what they thought. And the Nazi leaders are placed on trial. About 16 people are going to be put on trial. Or I'm sorry, 24 people are put on trial. Um, some of them, like Joseph Goebbels here um, down there uh, in, this, in the seat, um, are going to be um, put on trial at the Nuremberg war crimes trials, similar to the Nuremberg laws, but the war crimes trials. And uh, they are accused of something referred to as crimes against humanity, uh, which is basically saying genocide. One of their defenses was that they didn't break any German laws because it wasn't illegal to kill a, a, a German Jewish person. Uh, they also said that the, the soldiers said that they were just following orders. And both of those defenses need to be accounted for. And the way that the lawyers at the Nuremberg trials did was by coming up with this idea of crimes against humanity, that even though a German law may not have been broken, every society has a law against murder. 
And what they did was murder. So therefore, they didn't just break German law. They didn't break a world law. They committed a crime against humanity itself. Of the 24 put on trial, 12 of them were executed, including that guy there. In 1948, in a response to the Holocaust after the Nuremberg trials, the United Nations issued the Declaration of Human Rights, that all people are all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood and that everybody has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Some of that information is taken from the Declaration of Independence. Some of that is the natural rights theory. It's written in 48 and inspired by the Holocaust. All right, so we talked about the European front and the Holocaust. Um, let's switch over to the Pacific theater and what the United States is doing in the western side uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the initial response is that the United States wanted a quick morale boost. And this guy here, John Doolittle, I think his name is John Doolittle, uh, volunteers for the Doolittle raids. Uh, about 20 different flights or 20 different planes uh, volunteered. Uh, they retrofitted some uh, bombers and uh, to be launched off of an aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier goes into the Pacific Ocean by Japan, uh, launches to drop bombs on Japan, just like they drop bombs on Pearl Harbor. The problem for the Doolittle pilots was that um, they would not be able to get back to any island that would be able to um, take their planes. So they drop their bombs and then they crash land in Russia and China, hoping to get to uh, somebody that would support them. Uh, interestingly, of the, I think, 20 planes that went out, only one plane crashed and uh, everybody on board died. A couple others had some people that were captured, uh, but most of those pilots actually survived and were brought back to the United States later. The um, overall strategy, though, because once the Doolittle raids kind of established this morale boost for the United States, the United States does have to then continue from Pearl Harbor over into... Um, into Japan, and they, the strategy they used was uh, island hopping. The initial turning point, the thing that, that initially gets the United States on the right track was the Battle of Midway. You can see that right here, right? It's midway between Japan and Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Midway attack is going to end up being the first in a series of victories that leads the United States towards the mainland of Japan. Japan. And the strategy they used was called island hopping. They would take strategic islands, bypass others, trying to neutralize them because every invasion would be like a D-Day invasion, this amphibious assault that would need to take the entire island. Um, notoriously, the Japanese were difficult to capture and they usually fought to the last person. Um, so they were just trying to get close enough to the mainland that they could drop bombs. And that means taking Okinawa and Iwo Jima, they could get to the mainland, drop bombs and come back. The United States was preparing for an invasion. So they got to Okinawa and Iwo Jima and they began firebombing cities. Uh, these maps here show areas that were completely burned out by the United States. Um, these were bombs, regular old incendiary bombs that were dropped on the United by the United States. Um, in Tokyo, something like, I don't know, half of the, the bombs, uh, the buildings were burned out. The United States was worried that by invading Japan, it was going to cost between a quarter and half a million soldiers lives, and they didn't really want to do that. So they have to make a difficult decision. Right? Truman knows that they have this new powerful weapon called an atomic bomb. And in order to prevent too many American lives from being killed, he decides to drop the American uh, drop the atomic weapons and to save American lives. The drop bombs are dropped. You can see the impact here um, on this side. This is what happened. Uh, this is before the bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. And this is after the bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. That's the same building that you're looking at. Or you can see that church and steeple right there. Hiroshima is bombed on August 1945. Nagasaki is bombed on August of 9th of 45. The United States threatened a third bomb. Uh, the United States did not have a third bomb, but Japan didn't know that. So they surrendered on August 14th, and victory in, in the Pacific was declared September 2nd. And this creates a whole new can of worms. There's some evidence that Japan was prepared to surrender without the use of atomic bombs. Uh, some generals have declared, from the era, some generals declared that they didn't think that dropping the atomic bomb was necessary, that Japan was ready to surrender. 
they just wanted a, the condition to be that the emperor got to stay in Japan because he was almost like a godlike figure. The United States wasn't having that. So they dropped the bombs and forced the surrender, killing many, many, many people and leading to many controversies later. The Soviet Union knew this information, and the Soviet Union then made the conclusion that the United States was dropping the bomb not to end the war in Japan, but to make a threat towards the Soviet Union that did not yet have atomic weapons. <clears throat> this is one of the initial things that starts the Cold War, and it's going to start an arms race. Images like this are just going to continue to grow and grow and grow, and the Soviet Union and the United States are going to um, keep trying to blow stuff up bigger and bigger and bigger just to prove to the other that they can. In the end, the death toll is astounding. The Soviet Union, you can see, has almost 24 million people killed. China, nearly 20. Germany, almost 8 million. The United States comes out of this pretty, pretty okay, just like the United Kingdom, pretty okay in the sense that they don't take a huge number of casualties. They don't have a huge number of civilian casualties. And that's going to benefit them because the economy is going to be impacted by it later, which we'll talk about uh, in the next section when we start talking about the Cold War.